All right. Well, I'm going to add just like a couple of things to my description, I guess. Um, well, m I'm married. I actually got married last August. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, what's the best part? He is an amazing Catholic man whose goal is holiness. And honestly, it's the whole package. That's all a woman can wish for. Um, the second thing is that I was born and raised in Mexico, if you haven't noticed yet, by my beautiful accent. Um, and I am a proud immigrant. It has been a struggle being in the country, trying to learn the language, building a new community, understanding the, the system, the education system, understanding also the financial system, you know, the credit, and like, you name it. But, um, let me just go back to my script really quick, I'm sorry. Um, the second thing, the third thing I want to, to share with you is that I love vulnerability. It's, uh, it's own, I, I actually think it's a virtue, it's a virtue I've been trying to work on for more than 10 years. A good spiritual director, my, at the time, my, my spiritual director, my spiritual father as I call him, uh, he guided me for about like seven years. And he started guiding me at the age of 19. And so I was very insecure, not only because of the language, um, but also because as an immigrant, you somehow need to prove yourself. You need to prove your worth somehow. Um, and so I always was afraid to share about applications or news or, you know, you name it. And so he told me, you know, you need to start working on your vulnerability because it's beautiful. And if you look at the sayings, they were fully vulnerable. It's fine if you fail. It's fine if others don't find a worth in you as long as you remember that you are worth it. And so for over 10 years, I've been working on that vulnerability. And so today, I come to you and, and I actually pretty much ask for your permission for me to show, to, to to nut myself before you spiritually and mentally. Keeping the clothes on, okay? Don't worry. <laughs> um, but I want to be fully vulnerable with you and share my heart and share um, my experiences with you in this, during the time in this panel. The fourth thing I would like to share with you is that I love quotes. And who doesn't, right? It kind of feels like we live in a quoting time, so like we are a quoting generation. You see quotes like on t-shirts, mugs, the stickers, like you name it, all over. And so I'm just like, I have to confess I'm a sucker for quotes. You know, just tell me a quote, I'm going to write it down, and I'm going to try to memorize it because I love it. Um, but one day, here's the thing about quotes, some of them look attractive but they are not actually good for our soul. One day, a few, actually one day, a few years ago, I was doing my morning routine, usually my morning routine when I am stable spiritually, you know, we all have those times when it's just like, it sinks a little bit and then we have to like try to get back to it. But my morning routine, it starts at 5, 5.30 in the morning, I get myself a tea and I start working on like some meditation and reflection with my tea on my hand and then I get into prayer and then the scripture. And I buy those teas, I don't do coffee, I do tea. I buy the teas that have quotes in the little tags. <laughs> Am I alone? No, okay, thank you. Um, and so I was reading the quote and the quote said, the purpose of life is to know yourself and love yourself and trust yourself and be yourself. And as I was reading, I almost felt myself like saying like, yes, you know, like, yes, I got to love myself. But then I, I had to go to a scripture and just like something cringe inside of me in that moment. But I didn't pay attention to it. I was like, eh, still good quote. So I went to a scripture and because the Holy Spirit got jokes that day, I had to read Ephesians 5.2, and it says, live a life of love, just as Christ loved us 
and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. And so I went back to that little quote, you know, read it again, read the scripture, read it again. And I got into prayer, and that cringe inside of me increased, and I kept praying, and I just felt like the purpose, changing the whole quote, and I said, no, the purpose of life is to know Christ, and love my neighbor, and trust God's will, and be like Christ. And that has stayed in my heart, you know, but then I forgot about it all over again. Um, because the truth is that we live in a culture that promotes the you do you. That also, we live in a culture that we laugh when we catch ourselves having first world problems, right? Instead of actually reflecting and sitting and saying, wow, first world problems, like this, this, this is not right. Like, what are real problems? But Jesus modeled to us a selfless life to service of, to others. How? By being himself. Truly being himself, but also by paying attention to details. Paul Francis tells us that, that Jesus taught the disciples to pay attention to detail. And in Gaudete et Exultate, he says, the little detail that wine was running out at a party. The little detail that one sheep was missing. The little detail of noticing the widow who offered her two small coins. The little detail of having a spare oil for the lambs should the bridegroom delay. The little detail of asking the disciples how many loaves of bread they had. The little detail of having a fire burning and a fish cooking as he waited for the disciples at daybreak. That's my favorite one. Many times we read that passage, and it goes unnoticed that Jesus had a little fish burning for the disciples since they were working. That little detail of hospitality. Right? How many times we have a little fish burning for somebody else? In St. Therese of Lisieux said, love in the little things. And so Jesus taught us that it's about the little details. And it's also about selflessness and caring for others. But also another way that he modeled to us in a, this very quotable way, <laughs> how to model to us discipleship is in the shortest sentence in the Bible, or so they say, and is he wept, and he wept. Jesus modeled to us to live feeling intensely. Many times we are afraid to show our feelings, that either being anger or happiness or being ashamed or something, because we are afraid of the criticisms, because we've been told that we have to succeed. And the models of success that society has sold us as women are not the models of holy women in the scriptures or in the tradition of the church. And are not the models of Jesus living his life, right? When we are in the office and we weep, we are perceived as weak. But Jesus tells us that no, it's fine to weep. It's fine to feel and to feel intensely. And so... Pope Francis, going back to Pope Francis, because I love Pope Francis, to be honest. And he says, in Christus Vivid, he says, as a church, may we never fail to weep before these tragedies of our John. May we never become inured to them. For anyone incapable of tears cannot be a mother. We want to weep so that society itself can be more of a mother. So that in place of killing it, can learn to give birth, to become a promise of life. We weep when we think of all those young people who have already lost their lives due to poverty and violence. And we ask society to learn to be a caring mother. None of these pains goes away. It stays with us because the harsh reality can no longer be concealed. The worst thing we can do is adopt that worldly spirit whose solution is simply to anesthetize young people with other messages, with other distractions, with trivial pursuits. Perhaps 
those of us who have a reasonably comfortable life don't know how to weep. Some realities in life are only seen with eyes cleansed by tears. I would like each of you to ask yourself this question, and I love it because he's inviting us to a discernment prayer here. He's inviting us to like enter into a conversation with the Holy Spirit and ask these questions to ourselves. Can I weep? Can I weep when I see a child who is starving, on drugs or on the street, homeless, abandoned, mistreated, or exploited as a slave by society? Or is my weeping only the self-centered weaning of those who cry because they want something else? Try to learn to weep for all those young people, less fortunate than yourselves. Weeping is also an expression of mercy and compassion. If tears do not come, ask the Lord to give you the grace to weep for the suffering of others. Once you can weep, then you will be able, then you will be able to help others from the heart. So I'm about to be fully vulnerable here and tell you that the first time I read those passages, like those two paragraphs, I did not get it. I kept reading, you know, I didn't stop. I just didn't understand. And it wasn't until 2019 when I had the opportunity to go to Liberia. But first I went uh, over the summer to Rome representing the, the United States in the, in the Post-Synodal Youth Forum. And I was with about 250 young people, great, a great week, eating pizza, having gelato, you know, praying in beautiful shrines. And from Rome, I flew to Liberia. In less than five hours, I went from seeing beautiful cathedrals to seeing children trying to find food in piles of trash in the middle of the streets. One thing is when you grow up and somebody, you know, your mom tells you, eat all your food because there are children starving in Africa. But then another thing is when you go and like you are exposed to such such a reality that you had not been exposed to before. As an immigrant, I forgot, in a way, the struggles of growing up in poverty in Mexico, because it's easy to get comfortable. It's easy to grow up in a society that it's cheaper to throw away something than to repair it, right? A society where you have plenty of water that you just leave the, the fossil open. And so somehow I became very wrapped up in this world that is quotable, that I get filled up with one quote and another quote and another quote without a stopping and reflecting and looking at reality and actually letting reality sink in to change my soul, my mind, in the way I act, in the way I give my gifts to others. And so my first night in Liberia, I found myself on the floor crying, crying like never before. And I was angry at God. I was so angry. I had never been angry at God. And I know he's a beautiful father. He's a good, good father. I know that it's not his will that people live in poverty. And my master's degree didn't help me in that moment to reconcile the crushing realities of Italy, Liberia. And then to know that I was gonna come back. And so the work was not being over there, but after coming back. And it took me an entire year to unpack it, to actually allow myself to feel, but then to question myself, what is the Holy Spirit asking of me? Why am I seeing these realities? Why am I hearing the different needs? In talking to my bishop at the time, Bishop Barnes, uh, and Bishop Emeritus now from the Diocese of San Bernardino, he said, because God wants you to be a pilgrim of the faith, not a tourist of the faith. And so when we learn to weep with the realities of the everyday life, the pain, the challenges, of the immigrants, of the parents who are struggling educating their children and finding a good system, then we are allowed, we are open to allow the Holy Spirit to move us to the service of God's kingdom. 
But it unfortunately took me to go all the way to Liberia to understand that. But it also took me the help of my, of my spiritual director. And so when it comes to gifts and talents, um, I actually have the model of my geometry teacher in high school. I was in the United States for about six months and I had arrived about like six months and I was in high school um, and I went to the counselor because it was time to apply for high school, for college and everybody was talking about like college applications and I'm like, well, maybe me too, you know, like I can do it too. And so I went and she said, oh honey, I'm sorry, but you are not college material. But you know what? I said, she might be right because I don't know this country. And maybe I was pretty smart in Mexico, but maybe I'm no longer smart here. This is different. And so Ms. Rios asked us one day out of nowhere in class, what was her plans for college? And so finally, I mentioned what Ms. Leal said. And next week, I heard that Ms. Rios got together all my teachers and asked them to sign a letter forcing my counselor to help me apply for college. And so she did. At the end of that day, I went to her classroom and I asked, why did you do it? And her answer inspires me until today. And she said, this is a secular high school, I have to say. And she said, because I am Catholic and I cannot see an injustice happening in front of my eyes. Now, Ms. Rios didn't know that I was Catholic, but she knew that she was. And she knew what discipleship was and what it meant to be, to be living discipleship in the universal church. And so since that day, I tried to keep Ms. Rios' memory, but also tried to live up to what it means to be a disciple out in society. So that's a little bit about myself. Thank you. Sister.